A very good day to you. Liz Skelton here, Principal Consultant at System Concept. We're a specialist research, training and consultancy firm based in Covent Garden in London, where by the wonders of modern technology, I'm broadcasting this webinar from today. We've got around 45 minutes to go through the presentation slides and videos. And also, if anyone's interested in contacting me after the webinar, I'm always happy to connect with like-minded um, health and safety professionals and IOSH members, particularly to share best practice and to hear your stories about how you've got on presenting your business cases. I have a little confession to make. I'm an MBA student and a little bit sad. I really like to collect business cases and case studies. So if anyone has a particularly good one that they want to share with me, I'd be absolutely fascinated to find out more. So a warm welcome to the webinar Meaning Business. Let's get going. We're going to give you a brief overview on the five key elements for a compelling business case. It's applicable to all sectors and all levels of business. And I hope that you find it useful and can take some of this learning away and apply it to the work that you do. I'm sure you'll have all heard of the excellent IELTS Life Savings campaign. The campaign centres on three key aims. We want to help businesses to get the most out of their health and safety management, not just talking about compliance, but also about the business benefits of health and safety. We want to help members work in organisations to make sure that they are getting the best out of their budget. And we want the government to take action. A few simple steps can save billions for UK PLC. I have to say the campaign is very effective and it really inspired me as a practitioner to thinking about how we can make the health and safety business case more compelling. So I've analysed some case studies, tried some things on my own personal clients, some went well, some not so well. And I've spoken to colleagues and other health and safety professionals about what they've done in their organisations to get the business case across. I'd like to share with you during the webinar five simple tools that you can use to develop a meaningful business case to present to your budget holders. I'd like now to show you a short video of Bridget Gilmore, a fellow practitioner. She explains how she changed the way she communicated about health and safety and how presenting a professional business case changed attitudes to investment at top level managers. I've worked with the client for a number of years, so I've got to know parts of their business and I act as competent support for them, so I deal with some quite high level people within the organisation. It's got a lot of sites and then it's got a different number of people depending on which site it is, so head office has got a lot but then their other sites have got not very many staff at all. Lots of different types of accidents, um, a number of riddles, a high number of accidents in general, but across all different types of accidents. They also have quite a lot of members of the public have accidents, so they do have to deal with that interaction within their sites as well. So that increases the numbers in general. In a time of recession, so the money is not freely available, and the reactions being that there is no money to spend on some of the additional things that might be on a wish list to try to prevent some of the problems or to try to work things through, their reaction was that there was no budget available, so they couldn't do anything else. Having sat and seen and heard about some of the life savings campaign, that it made me rethink the information that I'd got and how to reconsider with them exactly what they were looking at and how to put a message across in a different way to them. So I looked at the accidents, looked at what had been reported and did a really, really conservative estimate on how much time, how, much, how many people had been involved in the reporting process and then also looked at the riddle reports and considered how many of those there'd been and how many days off staff might have had. But being really conservative, just considered three days per over three day accident, so didn't go to the full detail of how many people had been off. And it became a, quite a high number and it equated to a number of weeks of manager's time. But if you consider how much a manager costs to employ and have working, it was a lot of time for them and it suddenly changed their attitude to what was being said. 
shock. It was a shock for me because I'd never sat and looked at that before. But they didn't realise how much time was being taken and not to say wasted because the staff were still working, but that time was time that could have been spent doing something an awful lot more important and the money could have been better utilised somewhere else within the business. So, as you can see, So, as you can see, making an effective business case can make a difference to get buy-in on health and safety, particularly in these tough economic times when we're competing with other departments to get money. It's important to stand out from the crowd. So now it's time for us as health and safety practitioners to get creative and find different ways to get the message across. The most effective way is to talk in the same language as senior members of staff that we work with. Remember, money talks. So what is a business case? A business case gives the reasons why you need to do a project and justifies how your organisation is going to spend its time, money and resources. Any business case that you make needs to show that you understand what the business needs and you understand their requirements for senior managers. You also need to show where the market is and where the organisation is going and that you're the type of person that they want to work with and also that you share the same goals. You also need to show um, that you know who the business is up against, that you understand the competition and what gives your company a competitive edge. And that you're going to work hard to make it happen and don't expect the business to hand um, you a pile of cash on a plate. So when you develop a business case, define the scope of your project, develop the solution, you may find a couple to choose from, Put a price on it, document it, so you need to make sure you put the results in a short and easy to read report, with lots of visuals and an executive summary. Also get buy-in. You might need to present the case um, to the board. And remember to tell them how you're getting on during the project. Um, you're more likely, they're more likely to invest in you in the future um, if they know that you are spending their cash wisely. So report back to them. So how do you make a business case? Well, key element number one is about doing your research. Before you even start developing your business case, you need to scope out the project and see whether it's worth doing. The only way to do this is through research, research and research. You need facts, figures, costs, details on return on investment and when you're going to get that return. And um, you'll need to do a lot of number crushing. Speak to your HR department to get the thickness of figures. Talk to your finance director to get cost of downtime um, of accidents and incidents and thickness. Go and see your operations manager to get details of the impact of lost time incidents. And find out the average cost of wages in the business. Um, it's a good place to start if time is money. Also make sure that you have good data about national figures as well. Get it from a renowned source like the HSE website, IOSH, benchmark with other organisations too, and use the IOSH networks, um, the sectors and branches um, who can really, really help you out. Another good source is internal data, um, but don't use hearsay, always state where you got your data from. Don't just look at one option too. Look at different options and rank them. Work out um, what your top two are. I suggest, I suggest that you let your senior management team know the ones uh, that you dismissed as well. This shows that you've worked out what's called the opportunity cost. An opportunity cost is the opportunities that um, they the best option. So by doing this, you'll show that you've thought things through carefully and that you've chosen the best available options for them. Just remember that the opportunity cost is the opportunity lost. And by working out your opportunity cost, 
It will also help you to work out whether you have an investable project yourself. If it is investable, then you need to be reasonable about what you're trying to achieve. If you um, have really high accident statistics, don't expect them to be zero in three months. It's just not going to happen. And if your organisation is making cuts, don't ask for a million pounds investment. That isn't going to happen as well. Remember, you need to start small and show results. You'll also probably need to make some assumptions about the benefits of your business case. Um, you will have factual real data, so the number of employees, fitness absence costs, but you're also going to have to make some assumptions as well. Um, and that's going to be, um, you're going to be looking at potential variation and a little bit of uncertainty. Um, you're going to have to make educated allowances. So being aware of the most likely results and the best case and worst case scenarios shows that you really know your stuff and use examples, provide spreadsheets, provide lots of um, numbers, lots of information. Also make sure that um, you know exactly who you're speaking to. Are you going to be speaking to the decision maker or the influencer? You might need to do some stakeholder mapping as well to work out who your allies need to be. And then you can tailor what you're going to say in a slightly different way to each of them. So, the next element is to make sure that you clearly link and explain how each feature of the project contributes to the business and what the benefits are. You need to be prepared to answer difficult questions and really know your facts and figures. Your CEO is going to question um, the purpose or inclusion of a particular part of your case. I suggest you do some, com um, some cost-benefit analysis and marginal analysis to help you. So cost and benefit analysis is where you look at the cost of each of the benefits and find out whether it's worth doing or not. And just to explain if you don't know what marginal analysis is, marginal analysis shows any additional benefit from an activity compared to the additional cost of that activity. So companies use marginal analysis as a decision making tool to help them maximise their profits all the time. Um, and we do marginal analysis every day. So, for example, if you already exercise five times a week and you're thinking about adding a sixth day, you'd use marginal analysis to determine whether the benefits of the sixth day, um, such as giving it, um, such as the additional calories that you've burned, uh, would be worth the cost of the sixth day, such as giving up sleeping or increasing your risk of injury. You also must be able to quickly justify the operational impact and um, say what the cause and effects are and how it affects the company's bottom line. So, for example, if you're working in a hot desking environment, just using laptops and not having computer monitors on desk can correlate to your employees getting neck problems. But how does this affect the operations and the bottom line? You need to explain the on costs, the effect on customer service. And you might want to use marginal analysis to work out how many monitors you might need. For example, do you need them for every uh, desk or just 60% of the desk? So you need to justify your operational um, impact. You also need to be prepared to, um, to negotiate so you know how far you go without causing risks to people or the organisation. Now we all know that what me gets measured gets done. So you need to set clear performance, uh, key performance indicators as part of your business case. Identify a key performance indicator for each benefit. Key performance indicator will show whether something that you've implemented has been successful or not. Um, and identifying which factor measures um, the success of a particular benefit is absolutely 100% key to understanding the business case and ultimately whether the senior management team is going to accept it or not. So without clearly identified KPIs, executives are not going to be able to determine the validity of a specific benefit or measure the progress of an initiative. Remember, they're not the experts in health and safety. So um, they need to know what good looks like and also what you're trying to achieve. If you don't have clearly defined KPIs, 
what you're trying to achieve might become lost. Um, so once that becomes lost, your business case will be lost as well. You also need to make sure that your KPIs are specific, measurable, achievable, realistic and time-bound. So smart indicators. And try and use leading indicators rather than lagging indicators because this refocuses things onto the positive. Think about the risks as well. When I talk about risks here, I'm not talking about the health and safety risks, but the financial risks. So what can happen if the organisation does invest? How much money are they putting up? Also consider if they're investing in fixed costs like equipment or variable costs like labour. These tend to be viewed and accounted for separately. Most businesses are keen to keep both as low as possible, um, but like to know if there's going to be peaks or troughs in their costs. Consider your short run, the fixed costs in the near future, and the long run, um, the costs that might change in the long term. Also, what return will they get for their investment? Work this out over a time period. Um, when will they start to see the money that they've, um, they've invested paid back? Imagine that you're in the Dragon's Den. What questions would Duncan Ballantyne and Hilary Duvet on Dragon's Den be asking? Are you justifying everything financially? Also explain what the risk of investing and not investing can do to the bottom line. Use case studies and examples from other organisations to help you. The Life Savings Campaign has lots of them to help you, and the HSE website is also a good source of information. Use spreadsheet sheets as well to do your cost-benefit analysis and marginal analysis, and then turn them into visual representations. Excel can help you turn a spreadsheet into a graph, so it's worth familiarising yourself with it. It's definitely worth showing that you've put the work in. Because making that little bit of extra effort can really, really go a long way. And a second uh, campaign material shows that you've um, shows a work example um, of a cost-benefit analysis on fleet safety, uh, which is a really, really useful template. If you get in touch, I've also got a template for presenting a business case. Um, it's worked in the past for me and I can guide you through um, your own if you need help as well. Also think about what can happen if they don't invest. Could the organisation lose customers? Will it affect their um, service, product quality, employee productivity? Will it affect either their variable or fixed cost base as well? Could they lose market share? Uh, are other organisations who compete with them already doing what you're proposing and are they being successful? It could be that small margin that makes the difference to them and um, gives them more share of the market. Also, could they avoid future costs if the investment is made today? So think about what the legal costs are. Use case law as example. Extrapolate absence figures over a five-year period. Calculate downtime costs. As Bridget Gilmore said in the video, you can show how much manager's time is lost, but be conservative with your estimate. Also, I think this is really the key thing, is just be aware of your organisation's strategic goals and values. So a typical strategic goal is to satisfy and delight customers, be the best place to work, develop thought leadership. Very, very high level statements. So link the message to what your organisation is doing at the moment. Use current examples. Maybe suggest a pilot study in an area that you know is going to help you out, one of the friendly departments. And also make sure it fits with other plans. So if there's recently been a leadership seminar on resilience um, run by the HR department, then you could use that as a springboard to introducing the HSE stress management standards. If you hear that there's going to be a PC refresh, link it to bring in, um, in the new DSE risk assessment software that you've been thinking about. Make sure that you set the standards, benchmark internally and externally, and know what's possible and what's realistic to achieve. If you set the goal post, post too far away, then you're not going to be credible. And think about the risks and benefits before you go in there. What's the risk of doing it and what's the risk of not doing it? Who will it affect? 
don't make this woolly, really, really pin it down. Actual costs, actual legal issues, and case law of when it hasn't gone right. Tell them what their competitors doing, are doing. It really, really works. Also, look in your annual report or on your internet and find out what your strategic goals are. Make sure that you align your message to one or all of the strategic goals. So if your organisation wants to increase net profit by 10% um, annually, then show them how you can achieve 10% off the bottom line. Um, or if they want to develop leadership abilities and the potential of our team, then show them how delivering a managing safety course can help achieve this. If they want to achieve and maintain outstanding customer service, show them how carrying out a HSE stress survey can help achieve this. The senior management team created the strategic goals, um, so they're going to be looking for ways to achieve them so that they look good. Uh, you can help them look good. Um, a project with a high return on investment is great, but it's not a complete business case justification if the proposed solution doesn't actually align with the company's strategic goals. If it's not in the strategic goals, they're just not going to do it. So a great business case really goes uh, beyond the simple return on investment, it demonstrates strategic intent. So if you want more information then I recommend that you use the link to the life savings campaign. There's some really good videos and great resources that can help you. The how to do guide is going to take you through um, writing a business case and there's some great public and private sector case studies from um, sleep management right the way through to stress management in there. I've used them myself and I find them really, really useful. I just want to show you a short video um, about what E.ON did and how they added value to their business and employees through one of their initiatives. When I took over, we started to look at the data that we had. So we looked at all of the absence data, all of the accident data, all of the near hit data. And from that, we do the analysis, a Pareto analysis, that tells us where to focus our attention. Once you understand which issue to focus on, then we can go away and look at the best techniques for dealing with it. As a large organisation, you collect certain data naturally. So sickness absence data is an important indicator for us. So that's collected. Part of the core activity of my team is to make sure that we understand accidents so we go and collect a lot of accident data. So it, we, we had the data and it was simply a matter of analysing it properly. Absolutely. That's how you find out how to deal with things properly. So for example we, uh, we visited Transport for London, we visited BT to look at how they manage their absence and looked at the techniques they use for things like mental health and uh, musculoskeletal disorders. I think it's absolutely vital, otherwise you've got to relearn every single lesson. So talking with people, find out what's worked and what hasn't, just absolutely informs what you do. For things like the absence management, we simply took the average salary, looked at the number of days lost per full-time equivalent, and then calculated out the cost, and then worked out roughly what we'd save if we managed to move that to a benchmark level. Uh, for other uh, programs we've looked at different things. So for driving we've looked at accident costs, for musculoskeletal disorders we've looked at the costs of those kind of issues and the absence associated with it and for things like mental health we looked at the absence costs. The clearest thing is just how many days people are away. So we tend to calculate the direct cost just on the average salary that somebody's off. So for example you take a figure of say £160 a day and just multiply it up by the number of days and the number of people varies tremendously about where you are in the business. So for example, if you've got a salesperson, you've got opportunity costs, that is the sales that they didn't get. Some of this is difficult to quantify, but for example, let me use the Challenge Counter campaign we ran a couple of years ago. 
when you work that out, that worked out at about 43 pence per person. So absolutely small beer in the scheme of things. But it's not just about the pounds, shillings and pence. It's about the time that's involved. So one of the challenges we had, we wanted to take people out to the business for 15 minutes, which doesn't sound a lot, until you scale it up to 15 minutes per person for 15,000 people, and then it's an awful lot of time. But it works the other way as well, because if you can save a small amount, it builds up. So every day of absence is 160 pound, roughly. That soon mounts up until you get a 28 million pound saving. We start at the top. We start with our senior managers and our directors and convince them of the reason to do things. And then we cascade it down through the organisation. We're very fortunate that we've got a very supportive management team here that want to do the right thing. But as well as that, there was a very strong cost argument. So, for example, for absence management over the last three years, we've saved £28 million. Now, to small companies, that seems a great deal. And it is. But you can scale that down. Every person that's off every day, if, say, the average salary is £160, you know, it soon mounts up. If you take something simple like fast-track physiotherapy, you get somebody into physiotherapy for a musculoskeletal disorder, and on average you'll reduce their absence by about 20 days. I think a great level of engagement. What we find is when we do things like health promotion around, for example, this year cardiovascular at risk, what it does is it keeps, keeps people, occupational health in people's eyes and minds and so you get better referrals. So you're seeing people at an earlier stage and it's easier to deal with the stuff that comes through. But we did a campaign a couple of years ago on challenging cancer and what we found was one or two individuals presenting with early stages cancer which they wouldn't have otherwise detected. So essentially you know, we've helped them with their life a great deal and that's very rewarding. It's been a huge success, um, got a number of awards for what it's done and also gives people a very good feel-good factor. People like talking about the stuff that's been done and actually it delivered a lot of benefit, £28 million worth to the business. Also, um we do run a course at um, IOSH, this is a, a continuing professional development course called Meaning Business. And this shows you how to develop and deliver a business case for health and safety. The course um, also shows you how to hone your message and present it with impact. And I'm just going to show you a short video about um, the content of the course and how you can learn more about making the business case for health and safety. IOSH has created a new continuing professional development course called Meaning Business, Developing and Delivering the Business Case for Health and Safety. The course has been devised as part of IOSH's life savings campaign which has one simple message, good health and safety management can save businesses serious cash. We spoke to health and safety professionals about the importance of developing a business case to get buy-in for your health and safety project. Well, a business case is about giving senior executives a line of sight. So it's about um, showing how much effort they have to put in, how much resource they have to be uh, put in to get a business benefit. Well, when a senior executive team is um, looking at their business risk, health and safety is just another risk. So what, they, um, what a health and safety professional needs to do is make their case stand out from the rest and provide solid facts, figures, information that can help their business case move forward. I think it's a very good idea when you often have different facts and figures that you've collated and statistics, you haven't always got a good um, case to put forward to senior management. So collating it in a nice, tidy way, talking their language, hopefully will benefit them and get answers and hands in pockets. I think it's a good idea. I think it's another way of introducing what can be a difficult subject into the boardroom and into clients that maybe need to see things and appreciate things differently to the way they've always done things. 
everybody on the boardroom is looking for some way of saving money. And if you can just gently tug them in the right direction, then you're more likely to take them with you. I have to say that um, the extent of uh, applying cost-benefit analysis, um, although I've done it in other um, aspects of business, I uh, have never really applied it to health and safety before. I uh, tended to focus more on you know, the reasons, the moral, legal and social reasons why you would do it. Um, but having um, looked at some of the benefits of, um, I suppose, speaking the language of your senior managers and the directors, um, what they're expecting to see, as they would from, for any other project that's being delivered, it makes absolute sense to um, deliver health and safety in the same way. So information that you need to get together for uh, making a business case are things like uh, look at your risk assessments. Where are the main risks that, you, um, that your business has? Also, uh, you can benchmark with other organisations. Other sources of information, you can get some fantastic information from the IOSH website and the Life Savings Campaign. There's some fantastic case studies in there which you can use. And um, also the HSE website has some really useful um, case studies which help to explain what the business benefits are. Other information that you um, will definitely need are um, information on your absence stats, how many employees you have. Link your business case to, to your strategic objectives, to the strategic objectives of the organisation. So if an organisation is saying that they want to, to save 10% off the bottom line, show the business how you can actually do that. I'd just like to thank you. I'd just like to thank you very much for your time. I hope that you found the webinar useful today. And if you'd like to get more information, then um, you can contact me. It's Liz Skelton at systemconcepts.com. And I'm more than happy to help you to make the right business case for health and safety for your business. Thank you very much.